Hey, it's good to, uh, to be with you today. I, I know some of you, some of you I don't know, and it's just good to be back. I'm glad that everything was back in shape when I came, you know. It was in shape when I left, and so it's good to see that. Um, introduce my wife who's sitting here. I wish I could see you, but this, you know, the, the reflection, uh, but my wife's sitting over here. And she's been my wife. This year will be 50 years, you know. And, and she deserves your hand because we were in the ministry all those years. Well, we're still in the ministry and in relationship of, of working in a little different light. Thank you. That's so much better. Um, in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22, it says that, Laughter is a gift from God. It's good medicine. So I just wanted to start with a couple of stories. And this is just the way that we used to preach in the olden days, okay? And uh, so I always share a couple of, of, of stories. Uh, the first one, I, I don't want to be a, offensive to anyone who has pets, okay? Uh, but this is, this is just a little story about how to wash a, a cat, okay? Anybody tried to do that? Give their cat a bath? All right, so it goes this way. How to wash a cat. Put both lids of the toilet up and add one-eighth cup of pet shampoo to the water in the bowl. Pick up your cat, soothe him while you carry him towards the bathroom. In one smooth movement, put the cat in the toilet, close the lid, you may need to stand on the lid. At this point, the cat will self-agitate and make ample suds. Never mind the noises that come from the toilet, the cat is actually enjoying this. <laughs> Flush the toilet three or four times. This provides a power wash and a rinse. Have someone open the front door of your home. Be sure that there are no people between the bathroom and the front door. Stand well back behind the toilet as far as you can and quickly lift the lid. The cat will rock it out of the toilet, streak through the bathroom, and run outside where he will dry himself off. Both the toilet and the cat will be sparkling clean. <laughs> I like that. Okay. Laughter is the best medicine, the Bible says. Uh, one more, and then we'll, and then we'll go on. A three-year-old, a three-year-old walks over to a pregnant woman while waiting with his mother in the doctor's office. The little boy asks, why is your stomach so big? And the lady replies, I'm having a baby. The little boy says, is the baby in your stomach? And his eyes are wide in wonderment. And she says, yes, it is. The little boy says to her, is it a good baby? And he kind of has a little puzzled look on his face. And she says, oh, yes, a really good baby. And shocked and with surprise, the little boy says, then why did you eat him? <laughs> okay, you ready for the word? That's what Josh says every week. I, I got to tell you. We watch the messages on YouTube every single week, so I hear every single message that, that he preaches, you know, and I think he's doing a good job. What do you think? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so today we're going to talk about 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, that basically says, for all the promises of God in him are yes. And in him are amen to the glory of God through us. How many promises? All. And all in the Greek is? All. See, I told you I watch every message that comes out of here. All right. All right. You know, um, your theme this year is by grace through faith. And everything, you know, as well as I do, everything has been provided by grace and appropriated by our faith. I want you to think about the last gift you were given 
whether it was your birthday, your anniversary, what it might have been, but the last gift you were given by anyone, you know, the person who gave you that gift, that's the grace, okay? When you opened up the gift and appropriated that gift to your life, that is faith. And God is the greatest promise keeper ever. I happened to look up and just to see 8,810 promises in the Bible. Out of those 8,810 promises, 7,487 of them are promises made by God to mankind, to you and I. From the promises from the first Adam in Genesis to the last Adam, Jesus Christ, that Jesus is coming again in Revelation with his bride, the church, to watch Jesus fight that final battle of Armageddon where Jesus becomes victorious and Jesus sets up his thousand-year reign on earth and after that, eternity in heaven. Those are all promises that are ours. I looked up what the definition of a promise is. A definition of a promise is a covenant or declaration that one will do exactly what they say or something will happen just as it's pledged. God is true to his word and to every promise that he makes to us. For all the promises of God are amen in Jesus and yes. I like how the message puts it. Let's put the message up there, okay? Whatever God has promised gets stamped with the yes of Jesus. Think about that. Whatever God has promised in the scriptures gets stamped with the yes of Jesus. In him, that is what we preach and pray, the great amen. God's yes and our yes together, that's a partnership, gloriously evident. God affirms us, making us a sure thing in Christ putting his yes within us. So I want to talk to you today about three things. First of all, the stability of the promises of God. Second of all, the strength of the promises of God. And third, the never-ending nature of the promises of God. Because you know as well as I do, because I hear Josh preach it to you all the time, that God works through people. Amen? And wherever we appropriate or wherever we believe and place our faith in those promises, God gets the glory. You see, when people get saved, God gets the glory. When people get healed, God gets the glory. When people prosper, God gets the glory. I like to say it that that God will get the glory for my story. And whenever you share your story, your testimony with anyone, God gets the glory. Every time you appropriate a promise of God, what you are doing is that you are pointing to God for other people. I am reminded of a professor we had in Bible college. His name was Cyril Simpkins, and he taught the book of Acts. And he would tell his students, as we would gather, you know, in the first of the semester and very first class, he would come in and he would tell us at, at the beginning, he, said, he would basically say, I'm going to throw an A at you and you're going to have to do everything in your power to not get an A in this course. Now, I like a teacher that talks that way, okay, because I wasn't always a good student, He said, I'm going to work for you, and I'm going to be with you, and you're going to have to dodge it to miss an A. I need to tell you that it's the same way with God when it comes to the promises of God. He throws his promises at everyone. And those who believe in Jesus have to work really hard to miss those promises. In fact, the difference between believers, the maturity, the difference in maturity of believers. You know, you could just about go to every church in Plano or Sandwich, and just about every single church would tell you that they believe in one God. 
They would talk about the fact that they believe in the same Jesus that we believe in. They would, they would talk about the fact that the Trinity involves the Holy Spirit. So what is the biggest difference or the maturity difference in, in Christians today? It's the fact that some appropriate more of the promises of God. Some look at the promises of God and go, those aren't actually for us today. Others look at those promises and look at the scriptures and go, every single thing that God promised us in the scriptures is true for us. I mean, think about it. The New Testament says, all who call in the name of the Lord shall be saved. All. Every single person that calls in the name of the Lord can be saved. That's a promise to everyone. Everything that God will ever need to do and have to do has already been done in Jesus. You know that. God said, sent Jesus to the cross, which is God's yes. When Jesus died on the cross, that was Jesus' yes. And your yes is when you're obedient to the Holy Spirit. It's a partnership. God's yes and our... But I got to tell you this. There's a little disclaimer here. God, if you're... If God says yes to something, promises that, and you say no, it's going to bring frustration in your life. But if God's yes and our yes, that brings revelation in your life. And that's a huge difference for people. You know, in the past, God has said yes, and maybe maybe you're here today, and maybe God said yes about something, and you said, no, I'm not sure I want to do that, or I'm not sure I want to go that direction. But you know what? Most people want results like God said yes, and they said yes. And you know what? Some people have walked 10,000 steps away from God. They've walked away from God. And yet, it's only one step, it's only one turnaround step that brings them, can bring them right back. And so this morning, as you're here, you know, maybe there has been a time in your past, or maybe right now, that God is really speaking to you, the Holy Spirit's really touching your heart, and is is in in, uh, asking you to go a specific direction, and you need to say yes to that instead of no. Yes will bring you revelation. No will bring you frustration. You know, there are some things that are never going to happen just because we pray for them. There are some things that won't happen until you're obedient to God. You know, Jesus didn't say, pray for the sick. He said, heal the sick. Okay? So, you know, when he said that, it doesn't necessarily mean that you shouldn't pray for for a healing, but he was going further than that. Jesus didn't say everyone is saved. He said everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He didn't say everyone prospers, but Jesus did say that if you would seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, all these things would be added unto you. See, there's an obedience part in that. You remember in Luke 17 where the, where the ten lepers, they come to Jesus, you know, and, and they wanted to be healed. And Jesus said, he said, be healed, go and present yourself to the priest, okay? And, it, and the Bible says, as they were going, they were healed. Not Not just because Jesus said so, but as they were going. Their obedience appropriated their faith. And it wasn't until they were going to show themselves to the priests that they were healed. If you look in Luke chapter 8, you have that story of the woman who was healed with the uh, issue of blood. The Bible actually says that she spent all her money on doctors. and, And she obviously, you know, in those 12 years prayed to God. You know, she, because she was a, a somewhat a godly person, and so I, I can't imagine how many prayers she probably offered up to God, you know, asking to be healed. But she wasn't healed until she touched the hem of Jesus' garment. She actually got 
down almost on her hands and knees and crawled and had to touch the hem of Jesus' garment because there was such a crowd around. And maybe for you, your greatest breakthrough is simply waiting for your obedience. Maybe your breakthrough is just waiting for your obedience. Because God gives you the promise, that is his yes. Jesus reveals the promise, which is his yes. And you put forth your obedience, which is your yes. And God says yes, and Jesus puts his stamp of approval on that. He says yes, and with your obedience, you say yes, and breakthrough comes. I know it sounds strange. But some things you pray for are never going to be given because you just pray for them. But they will be given when you become obedient to what the Father is asking you to do. And Jesus said, what did he say in the the model prayer? He said, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. You know, our sins are forgiven as we forgive other people's sins against us. You know, it's obedience. I don't know if you, you know, if a lot of you have the um, third season of, of The Chosen or you've watched the third se- season of The Chosen, um, but I think the third season has been uh, the, the best. And I like the, I think it's a, maybe even in the first episode or the second episode, Jesus sends out the twelve. The Bible records it in Mark chapter 6, and, and Jesus gave them authority over unclean spirits And it says that they went out and they were preaching repentance. And on the chosen, it shows them them preaching. They were casting out many demons. They were anointing with oil. Uh, Many of the sick were healed, you know. And and had they not taken that authority, had they not gone out, none of that would have been accomplished. You know, it's kind of interesting in the chosen because they said, well, you know, Jesus said that he wanted them to go out and do these things. And they pretty much looked at Jesus and said, you know, you want us to do these things? And, and basically Jesus said, you just do what you've seen me do. God said yes. Jesus said yes. The apostles were obedient in their faith. And that was their yes. In case you didn't know it, because I've heard Josh say this, Jesus is the perfect theology, correct? You just do what Jesus did, and you just do what Jesus said to be done. I mean, in the book of James, he says that we may get a healing from those in faith praying for you and anointing you with oil, according to James 5.14. But you see, in order for that to happen, somebody has to be obedient. Somebody has to do that. And God says, I'm going to work as hard as I can to throw these promises to you, blessings and favor, and you're going to have to work really hard not to experience them. And yet, we run into people who go, well, I don't believe that he works that way today. But what was the promise that Jesus gave us? Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Not a hard thing. Just do what I did, Jesus said. Now, it's no secret that we live in a world that's pretty unstable. You know, not a lot of boundaries these days. The only thing that's going to keep us anchored in this sea of instability are the promises of God. That's what they're there for. That we can read those promises and understand them and see them. And, and that's the anchor that keeps us stable in this life. You know, in my lifetime, I never would have thought that people would be confused with the gender issue, you know, especially because God says there's only two. Now, if you even guess wrong, you're 50% right half the time, you know. But, you know, that was basically a promise of God as well. Jesus promised us in, in Matthew 17, he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not come against it. You know, a lot of people think the church is getting less powerful today in this world. I see it as getting more powerful. I mean, we attend New Life Community Church in in Gardner, Kansas, where Lucas is, and and we see and hear weekly 
uh, about salvation. In fact, last Sunday was just one of the baptism Sundays about every um, month, month and a half. We have baptism Sundays, and, and there, were, there was probably 20 people last week that, that uh, were baptized. Um, but we hear, you know, uh, about salvation from the pulpit every, every, every single week. We hear uh, about people being healed in Matthew 10, chapter, or chapter 10, verse 8, Jesus called his 12 disciples to him, and he gave them authority, what, to drive out demons, uh, to heal every disease and sickness, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, uh, freely you receive, freely give. We hear that, we don't always see that, but we hear that within our church, this group, because we have a group called Freedom in, in our church. And meets on Tuesday night. My wife Kathy goes to that that group, and uh, they they watch, they teach, they share about praying, doing the things that Jesus did, and then they demonstrate those, you know, in relationship to people's lives, and people get healed. We hear and read testimonies, uh, you know, at the church, and they have them up on the screen many times about uh, people who have been prospered. From 1 John chapter 1, verse 2, that says, Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health as your soul prospers. But I understand that you know what that's about as well. I, I, I love the watching you are on YouTube, and especially the Sunday that you do the testimonies, and, and I hear the testimonies uh, that many of you are sharing and it just, it just does the heart good to hear how God is working through people's lives. God loves to favor his people. I, I realize the lady may not be here anymore, but I, one of the ones I loved the best was the lady who said she prayed that her son would catch a shark, and he caught a shark. You know, that, that, that's, you know, a lot of people go, well, why would somebody pray that, you know? Because God loves to bless and favor his people. I love to, to um, keep up with uh, Cliff and Sue in their ministry of changing the lives of those incarcerated. Because they too are claiming the promises of Jesus Christ. In fact, I think that we're living in the, in the best time, the greatest time, in the entire since the beginning of time. We are observing the greatest movement of God. We're seeing signs. We're seeing wonders. We're seeing miracles that increase. And I believe they're going to continue to increase as we move towards the end. Because the more darkness grows, the greater the light shines. Because light dispels the darkness. My granddaughter's in Kansas, and my granddaughter's here. Uh, they were together out in Colorado, and uh, the little ones uh, and that Lucas has were just remarking the other day about going to the Cave of the Winds. That was one of the side trips they took while they were out at Karis, and um, they said they went deep into the cave, and they shut out all the lights, and it was so dark, but then someone turned on a small light, and the small light and the darkness where you couldn't even see your hand in front of your face, they were telling me, you know, that small light dispelled the darkness. Testimonies are basically pouring in all over the world. Signs, miracles, and wonders promised by God. And you can, you can either be a part of that or you can change. Uh, you can choose to sit back and, and complain about the evil in the world. You can either believe and receive or you can doubt and go without. You know, you got one of those choices. In fact, Acts chapter 1, verse 8 was a promise that we would receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon us in order for us to be witnesses to the world. And you and I are those lights out there in the darkness. And I just want to encourage you to share your testimony, share your light as much as possible because even in the darkest places, even in the worst place, uh, you, you know, that you may be in a job that, that has just a lot of people that none of them know about Jesus. Even in that darkness, your light can shine. And every time you witness about Jesus, God is saying yes. Jesus is saying yes. And you're saying yes to the obedience to God, and your partnership is going to yield fruit. 
When you witness, God gets the glory for your story. And the promises show God working in the world through the church. I had him put up uh, Psalms uh, uh, 103 because I love these verses. And they're part of the promises. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits or forget none of his promises. He pardons all your iniquities, he heals all your diseases, and he redeems your life from the pit. That means there's breakthrough. He crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things, that's prosperity, so that your youth is renewed like that of an eagle. For all the promises of God in Jesus are yes and amen. Every promise God made is fulfilled in Jesus, and Jesus lives in us by the Holy Spirit. And so those promises are yours and mine. I mean, think about Ephesians 3.20. I know if Sue was here, she would, see, she would amen the fact that it's her, one of her favorite verses. Now to him who is able to do more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. God wants you to be blessed more then you want to be blessed. God wants you to favor you more than you want to be his favorite. And God wants to prosper you more than you can possibly even imagine. There was a man at the Karis Bible Conference, and his name is James Baker, and he said this to the church family at that Bible Conference. He said, God will not withhold healing from you because you're bad, and God will not heal you because you're good, but God will heal you because of what Jesus did on the cross. So we have to get our eyes off of ourselves and on to Jesus. It's not about us. It's about what Jesus did. People say, I'm afraid to pray for someone to be healed. Well, think about that. I'm afraid to pray for someone to be healed. Is that about the person who needs to be healed? No. Is it about Jesus? No. Is it about you? Yes. See, that, that's being self-centered. I am afraid to pray for someone to be healed. That's self-centered. We have to get our eyes off of ourselves and onto Jesus. For the promises of God in him and Jesus are yes. In fact, Romans 5, 17 says, For if by the sins of the one death reign through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Reigning in life is not suffering, it's not starving, it's not living in poverty, it's not living in addiction, it's not being powerless against evil. That is not reigning in life. Well, you might think to yourself, because I know people think this way sometimes, I'm not good enough to have all of that. So I just have this little phrase that I want you to say. You can write it down if you want. It's not going to be up on the board. You know, I just want you to repeat after me, okay? So repeat this. Healing is not my idea. It's God's idea. I'm not trying to convince him, but he's trying to convince me. Amen. That's exactly right. You know, when Jesus healed people, Jesus never looked at a person's goodness as a prerequisite to healing them. I mean, think about the woman with the issue of blood. Basically, because she had had an issue of blood for 12 years, the Jewish population would have said to her, she was unclean. She shouldn't have even been in that crowd. And yet she crawled on her hands and knees to touch the hem of this garment. The man born blind, or Jairus' daughter, or the man with the withered limb, you know, there are 37 miracles in the Gospels, and Jesus never looked at a person's past. He didn't even look at their present. 
He didn't look at any part of them and said, you know, I'm sorry, but you're just not good enough. I can't, I'm not going to heal you. But Jesus looked to the Father. And Jesus never said to those that need help, you, you know, I can't, I can't help you until you forgive this person or till you make up with your family or un, un, until you go and apologize to your co-workers or, or to your boss. He never said in any of that. He just healed them. He never said, clean up your life and then I'll heal you. And Jesus wants to teach you through the way of promise. I mean, if a person needs healing or salvation or prosperity, you know, he basically says to us, don't look at their past. Don't look at their ethnicity. Don't look at their job or how they're dressed or if they have one too many tattoos more than you think they ought to have or if they're people who swear a lot or are ungrateful. He didn't, he didn't ask any of those people if they played with the Ouija board sometime in their life. He just healed them. And this isn't about God's love, for he loves everyone. But those who see real breakthrough and the supernatural in their lives are those who stand on the promises of God. A long time ago, we used to have a hymn, Standing on the Promises of Christ my King. Through eternal ages, let his praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Everyone is qualified for salvation, healing, and prosperity because of what Jesus has done on the cross, not because of what we are doing. And the supernatural is activated when you stand on the promise of God. And when you step up in faith and believe for that healing, you step up and, uh, and maybe financially help someone out or step up and share salvation with them, God gives the promises, Jesus fulfills the promises, and we get to claim the promises. What a fantastic life in Christ that we would have 7,000 promises that will stabilize our life and we can stand on one of the things that Kathy and I went to the Caris Conference as well, but she got altitude sickness, so we had to go home, but they broadcasted it. So we're at home sitting, watching it on television, seeing our kids on television. They were sitting in the front row, I just want you to know. You know, grandkids are sitting in the front row, parents are sitting right behind them with their hands on their kids, you know. And, and, um, but one of, one of the speakers was talking about there. He said, Did you, do you understand that in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, when you sinned, you had to bring a sacrifice? Sometimes that might, it was different for different sins, but it might be a goat or a lamb or a bull or a bird or, or anything. But because of your sin, you would bring this sacrifice and you would give it to the, to the priest and, and the priest, you know what they did? The priest didn't look to see your quality. He looked at the quality of the sacrifice. Not the quality of the person. And praise be to God that under the new covenant and the new promise of God, God does the same thing. He doesn't look at you. He looks at the sacrifice of Jesus Christ who sacrificed his life for all your sins. And so he's looking at Jesus, and what's he see? That Jesus took our sin, he's a perfect Lamb of God. We need to get our eyes off of ourselves and onto Jesus because that's what God sees. It's hard for us sometimes to imagine that when we're praying to God and, and we understand that God is listening to us, that as he looks down upon us, that all he sees is Jesus Christ. But that's what the Bible says. And what does the Bible say also? It says we ought to fix our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that set before him endured the cross, despising his shame, and he sat down at the right hand of God. I want you to think about all the people that you know, all your family members, all the people that you have contact with. 
And I want to tell you that if they're not in heaven with you, it's not going to be because of their sin that keeps them out of heaven. It's going to be because they didn't receive Jesus Christ. Because once they receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, all of their sins, past, present, and future, are gone. And God sees Jesus instead of seeing them. They won't be in heaven if they don't receive the promise of God. For all the promises of God are yes in Him. God isn't dealing with you on your behavior. He's dealing with you on Jesus' behavior. You know, when I was growing up, I remember my parents, because I wasn't uh, the the smartest kid on the block, and, and my parents would tell my brothers and sisters and me that every time that we would get an A on our report card that they would give us $5. Now, back then, $5 was big time, okay? And, um, and, and we were really grateful for that. And I knew that every report card, I was going to get at least $5, okay? Because in our school, when you, you know... Um, Physical ed was a subject, okay? And when you were out for sports, which I was, you automatically got an A in physical ed. So whether or not I got any other A's, I'm not here to confess that, but whether I got any other A's, I got that one in in PE, and I got rewarded for that grade. But our Heavenly Father doesn't reward us that way. God doesn't look at our report card. God looks at Jesus' report card. And it's perfect. And it's all A's. And God blesses us because of Jesus, not because of us. So we need to quit thinking about ourselves and looking at ourselves and realize that when God sees us, he sees the perfect Lamb of God. Jesus didn't look at the woman caught in adultery and say, go clean up your life. He said, woman, where are your accusers? Or did no one condemn you? And then he said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. That's perfect theology. Man born blind. The disciples asked, Rabbi, who sinned? Remember, this man or his parents? And where were the disciples looking? Either at the man or his parents. And Jesus said, it was neither, but it was so the works of God might be displayed in him. I believe that we can lead more people to be saved, healed, and prosper when we stop looking at ourselves and look at Jesus. When we're asking God for healing for someone or praying for that healing or commanding that healing is really the way we ought to go, we ought to have our eyes fixed on Jesus, not on the person. The Bible says that we are the righteousness of Christ, according to Romans 5.1, for those that are in Christ. The woman at the well in John chapter 4, Jesus said, if you get your eyes off of yourself and put them on me, he said, you could have living water. The healing at the pool of Bethsaida, the man kept saying, what, what did he say? I have, Jesus said, you want to be healed? And the man says, Yes, but I have no man to put me in the pool. He says, I, I have no man. And while I'm coming, another steps down. You see, he was focused on himself. It wasn't about his illness for 38 years. It was about Jesus who said to him, pick up your pallet and walk. It's always about Jesus, never about us. For all the promises of God in him are yes. Focus on Jesus. When Jesus fed the 5,000, this was in the, uh, the, the chosen as well. And, and, you know, great depiction. And when he fed the 4,000, it was never about the amount of supplies they had. It was about the Father in heaven. And when you're focused on yourself and what you don't have, you're focused on the wrong thing. Your focus should be on Jesus, and Jesus is the very representation of of God. He is God in the flesh. He has everything. Faith is like a, you know, if you want to put it in more practical terms, faith is like an eyeball. It's always looking out. It's never looking in. It's always looking at Jesus as the 
and not the issue or the person. I think that's why people scoff when, when pastors get up and say that, you know, uh, or give testimony of the, of the fact of, of somebody being raised from the dead and people scoff and go, oh, that, that, that can't ha- happen today. You know why? Because they're thinking about that person. They're not thinking about God. Because nothing is impossible with God. Amen? And the number one reason why Christians, I think, have a lower rate of success in healing is self-righteousness. We look at ourselves or we look at that other person instead of focusing eyes on Jesus. Every person ever healed since the beginning of time and up through today never deserved it. In fact, God only heals people who don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. But we're healed because Jesus died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins and the healing of our bodies and the prosperity of our lives. And God isn't looking at me and saying, is Stan Motley worth it? No, he's looking at his son, Jesus Christ, the perfect Lamb of God. And is he worth it? Yes, he is. God's never going to deal with you on your performance, but he's going to deal with you on Jesus' performance and Jesus' righteousness. And let me just remind you, you don't always have to know the details to say yes to God. You don't have to have everything figured out to say yes to God. Jesus said, heal the sick. You don't have to have all that figured out. You just have to heal them in Jesus' name. You just have to say, be healed in the name of Jesus. And when you wanted salvation, you simply believed in Jesus that he died for your sins. And when you want healing, simply believe Jesus died for your healing. By his stripes you are healed. And I don't know whether you realize it or not, but you know, it takes a lot less energy to be blessed than to be rescued. Now, God does both. God gives us his favor, and God's also a lifeguard. And sometimes you're in a situation, and and you're calling out to God, and and you need to be rescued, and God rescues you. But I don't know if you realize that when God rescues someone, he takes them from where they are and just moves them over here outside of of what they want needed to be rescued from. And so it's kind of a sideways movement. But when God blesses you and God favors you, he pushes it ahead. He gives you more than what you had or more than what you asked for. And, and so you're always ahead. You're not just moved to side. And it takes a lot less energy to be blessed than it does to be rescued. I work part-time in a golf course to support my golfing addiction. I got to tell you that I'm an ad- golfing addict, and, and I have been for some years, but in working there, people come in and they pay money for the right to play nine or 18 holes of golf, okay? And every once in a while, someone will come in when I'm working and they will say, Mike Mallory, who's the owner of the golf course, they'll say, Mike Mallory, the owner said, I could play 18 holes of golf with a cart for free and you're supposed to also give me a hot dog and a pop. I said, and they give me a card that Mike Mallory had given them. Now, as the owner, Mike can throw everything he wants to anyone he wants, and they reap his favor and the blessings of the owner by acting in faith, by coming to the golf course and presenting Mike Mallory's card. But he can do that because he's the owner. Well, as the owner of the new covenant, God can throw everything he wants to everyone he wants at any time that he wants. And all we have to do is redeem those blessings and favors by being obedient to the claim, the promises of God. Owners give things away. Owners bless people. Owners show favor. I can't do that because I don't own the golf course. In fact, I remember one day Mike Mowry called me on the phone and the owner, and he, he told me, he said, when this person comes in, I, you know, he said, I want you to give them a, 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 a cart and 18 holes and anything they want food-wise that they want to eat. And he said, when they're all done, I want you to give them as much beer as they want to drink. He could do that because he's the owner. 
And I'm telling you that if, when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, God is doing that for those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. God not only does the blessings and the favor, he chooses to do the supernatural many times, not because you're good or because you're bad, but because of the righteousness of Christ appropriated to you. It's all about Jesus. Everything you will ever need was in the cross. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, has deposited in us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. God's yes is the cross. Our yes is the obedience. God's yes was Jesus. Jesus' yes was the cross. And your yes and my yes is obedience. And God's promises, which are founded in Christ have an unchangeable fulfillment, and he never changes his love for you whether you blow it or not. See, that's the great thing. Because you have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you might mess up, but God doesn't change his love for you. In fact, God never takes back any of the promises. In Romans chapter 11, verse 29, it says, For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. That is, that he doesn't take them back. That is God's grace. Now, you might be here today, and you might have some unfulfilled dreams or unfulfilled plans, or maybe there was a time in your life where God said, I want you to do this, and you pretty much knew by the leading of the Holy Spirit that that's what you were supposed to do. Or maybe you're here today, and you've been hurt or depressed or divorced, or maybe you're unhealthy, maybe you're on medication, maybe... Your husband left you or your wife left you and your children hate you and your boss don't like you. And, and, um, but let me tell you, don't change your theology to match your disappointment. Oh, people say, God, God, God isn't blessing me anymore. God isn't doing this. God, you know, I, 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 I'm not hearing from God. God doesn't stop talking to you. God doesn't stop blessing you. Stay at base your, base your theology on Jesus Christ because he's perfect theology. Jesus found hurting people and he healed them. You need to see that your dreams that maybe you had some years ago that God was directing you in a certain direction are still the dreams that God has for you. Why is that? Because God's promises in Jesus are yes and amen. And so you should let every area of your life match up with the power of the cross. James Baker also said, he said, we must become believing believers. Do you know how many believers really aren't believing believers? You know, he also said, in every Christian, if every Christian was a believer and, and saw healing, there would be no Christians that didn't believe in healing. And that's true. We got people who say they're believers, but they're not believing in the promises of God. And in order to be partners with God, we have to die to ourselves, you know, on our cross. Dying to your own desires, dying to your own plans and your ideas and purposes and grand schemes. God can't be a part of your life. God has to be your life. Christy wants to come, or whoever is playing today. That's my beautiful granddaughter, one of them right there. We're so blessed with six granddaughters. But I got to tell you, when you get a hold of the promises of God, you got to live those promises. You, you, you got to bank your life. You got to state your life on those promises. You got to live like you've been called. You got to live like the prayer that you want to be answered. You got to walk like that answer prayer. You have to sleep like that answer prayer. You got to tithe like that answer prayer. The greatest breakthrough in your life has already happened on the cross of Jesus Christ, where He said, It is finished. Now, God wants to restore some of the dreams that you had and buried. He wants to call them out like he called Lazarus out of the grave. You know what true freedom is? Freedom is when God carries the heavy end of the covenant, you know. 
and he carries the entire covenant. He's never going to change your mind, his mind about you. God never panics. He never worries. He's the eternal creator of heaven and earth. He takes up residence in you, and we are his instruments of bringing glory to God. So God, God's yes is cemented in the cross, and yes, and our yes is cemented in obedience. And so you need to say yes to God and let your mind say yes. Let your heart say yes to your plans, your purposes. Say yes. My soul says yes. In my discouragement, I want to say yes. In my confusion, I say yes. In my darkness, I say yes. In my anxiety, I say yes. In my stress, I say yes. One more verse and we'll be finished. What did Mary say when she was told that she would give birth to the Savior? In Luke chapter 1, verse 38, she said this. She said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be to me according to your word. God said, This is gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna mother the Savior of the world. And she said, Let it be to me as you have said. Are you willing to say that today? God, whatever you say about me, that that's true because God said it. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Every promise of God in Jesus is yes and amen. To see the power of God working through.